for instruction will go out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will settle disputes among the nations and provide arbitration for many people. They will turn their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nations will not take up the sword against other nations and they will never again train for war. Verse 5 says, The house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the Lord's light. Look at your neighbor and say, walk in the light of the Lord. Shake somebody's hand on the other side make sure they hear you say, walk in the light of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Walk in the light of the Lord. We solicit your praise. The kingdom of God is spiritual. Spirituality brings peace. Spirituality is defined as the great and enduring good. As love and devotion to God. It brings peace. It is indifference to worldly good. Spirituality is a thirst for heavenly blessings. Jesus said, blessed is he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Jesus said, blessed are the pure at heart, for they shall see God. Jesus said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for they shall have the kingdom of heaven. So we understand that the kingdom of God is spiritual and spirituality brings peace. The opposite of peace is destruction. Destruction is defined as the process or condition of being demolished or brought to ruin. And so we must keep in mind as children of God is that destruction is not like a 9-11 or like a Hurricane Katrina in the sense that it is a process in which some storms start out as little snow flurries, and then they turn into heavy snow storms before they turn into blizzards and avalanches. We must have the power of the Holy Spirit living within us in order to discern the seasons of life. In order to be a disciple, we cannot base our relationship with God on the things that are going on in the natural because the book of Ephesians teaches us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual wickedness that is in high places. So, anybody got their spiritual eyeglasses on today that you are able to see as a child of God, not only the peace that is going on in the world, but also the destruction. Uh, we just left Black Friday, and there in Texas, three women were brawling as they were fighting over the $99 tablet. There was another place in Louisiana where the people People had to be sprayed with pepper spray in the Walmart so that they could be calmed because of their excitement about what was going on in the natural. If we're not careful, we can miss the light of God during the Christmas season by looking for some physical things but missing the spiritual. Proverbs 14 and 12 said, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, or the end thereof are the ways of destruction. There was a time when we would look forward to all of the gadgets and gifts during the Christmas season, and we would calculate the accumulation of goods that we would receive, and we would therefore conclude that we had a successful Christmas by the number of gifts that we have received. We even would get on the phone with our friends and ask them that famous question, what did you get for Christmas? Anybody out there asking anybody, are you walking in the light of God this holiday season? Everybody wants to know what somebody is giving or getting for Christmas. Nobody is asking anybody. Are they walking in the light of God? Do you have the desire of the Spirit burning on the inside? Do you have uh, your war clothes on? Are you walking in the whole armor of God? It's amazing to me how the secret church has moved to the secular in order to accommodate and appease the status quo. We have even taken Christ out of Christmas, uh, allowing people to put Merry Xmas uh, on certain gadgets and signs so that the non believers
believer can be accommodated in a season that is of all really supposed to be about Jesus. Anybody out there can see the destruction of what is good taking place on a slow and progressive level. Things that were deemed as right and sacred in the eyes of God are now being compromised by the people of God. It's like spending time with family, like telling people that are close to you that you love them, like helping somebody that is in need, like feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, things that Christ did while he was here on earth. And he left us the commandment and the task to do these very things as followers in his name. We don't seem to have that burning desire. So what is God saying to us as a church? He wants us to burn with the desire for spiritual growth. It does not matter to me any longer how many gifts I receive for Christmas. Because as a person who is desiring to mature in the spirit, I want to be someone who gives what Christ has given unto me. I want to have a word for somebody who's discouraged this Christmas. I want to have some light for somebody that's in dark this Christmas. I want to, to celebrate. It doesn't matter when he came. This Advent season, I'm just thankful that he came because he is the light of the world. We can often become so complacent to the point where we are no longer concerned with our spiritual well-being. We get up in the morning and we eat breakfast while we're on our way to work. We're opening up that Burger King croissant and we're chomping it down as we're riding down Lawrence Road. Not even saying thank you, God, for the food that we're about to receive. When we get down to the meal of the evening with our families, we rarely at times... Uh, taking our time to say thank you in a prayer. Uh, many times we're so hungry and in a rush to get to the meal. Uh, we rarely give thanks uh, to what God has done. Uh, I'm not talking about nobody in here. I'm just talking about people in general. Uh, and we can often become so complacent uh, to the point where we're no longer concerned uh, about our spiritual well-being. Uh, because when the troubles of life uh, come our way, the test uh, of our spirituality is not by how often we attend church or how often we do something good to somebody else is how quickly we fall to our knees and all I'm trying to tell somebody who's struggling is it's hard to stumble when you're on your knees we must make prayer the foundation of our spiritual growth we gotta pray without ceasing not as form or fashion but praying that we really know is reaching heaven prayer that is with humble submission, that we're getting out of self. We're not coming to God with a Christmas list of what we want, but we're doing like Jesus in Gethsemane and saying, not my will, but thine will be done. Prayer is the foundation of our spiritual growth, and Isaiah is helping us understand the importance of a kingdom mindset, the importance of kingdom vision and kingdom mentality. Isaiah prophesied to announce the judgment and establishment of God's glorious kingdom. The problem in Israel during this time was idol worship. The problem in this day and age was what we would call today casual. Christianity. Many of God's people had allowed other faiths and other religions to come in and commingle with the teachings of Moses. The first five books of the Bible, the Torah, which are teaching of God's law that were to instruct us for righteous living and love among God's people. If we understand why God's word is necessary, you remember when God had the children of Israel after they had received freedom from the captivity in Egypt and bondage in Egypt. They were now at the foot of the mountain while God was talking to Moses. The priest Aaron had instructed them to give all of their ornaments to him and they made a golden calf while Moses was talking with God. The people were playing with God. While Moses was up on the mountain, the people were partying in the valley. I'm going somewhere somebody. While people 
people are taking uh, the prayer life uh, of the preacher for granted, thinking that the preacher can cover and atone uh, for the sins of a wayward congregation, uh, saying as long as I got the Moses praying, uh, I don't have to pray. Uh, but I'm here to tell you uh, that's a fallacy and a farce, uh, because when the judgment day comes, uh, he's not going to ask you who was your pastor. Uh, he's going to want to know, do you know Jesus? For his sake. In the view of the terribleness of that day, when Christ shall come to shake the earth and judge among men, we should shun the ways of sin. I know Paul said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but that still don't make it right. I know that we are all flesh that shall be made as grass and shall be cut down and led as sheep before the slaughter, but that still don't make it right. Therefore, we need somebody to cover us in our wretched and unrighteous state in our state of self-servingness in our state of selfishness in our state of looking to please and give pleasure to self and to avoid pain pain in our hedonistic society that has people on more povic that are more celebrities than people who are serving God we have to understand that we need to have a right relationship with God and the only way to have a right relationship with God is through Jesus Christ in the view of the privilege of the righteous hell of sharing in his universal kingdom we should seek to walk in the light of the Lord in all of our days and so this goes beyond the traditional Sunday morning routine of a Sunday school morning worship and perhaps an evening service or even a Wednesday or Tuesday Bible study God is looking for our prayer life to be the foundation of every word we hear in the religious setting because without prayer as the foundation of our spiritual walk, we can hear things with our natural mind that our spiritual mind wants us to see. In other words, when God is speaking to you directly through the preacher or through the preached word, you have to understand that this is not a natural word, that this is a spiritual word. God is providing direction for your spiritual growth and well-being. There are some things in our hearts that are not right with God and we can disguise them with Sunday suits and Sunday hats and high heel shoes and beautiful dresses and adornments. It's called church y'all and when we come to church we can act like we got it all together but the truth of the matter is we haven't been on our knees long enough to hear from God. We stay on our knees long enough for God to hear from us and this was the problem with the children of Israel. They would live lives in the way of casual Christianity. They would offer up burnt offerings and sacrifices. They would go to the temple mount as usual. They would ascend to Zion just as the Sabbath had commanded. They kept the Sabbath day holy, but they kept Sunday unholy. They kept the Sabbath day as the Bible had prescribed, but the rest of their days were just form and fashion. They were going through the motion. And God said he was sick of their burnt offerings. So Isaiah comes to prophesy to tell them that they must walk in the light of the Lord. Somebody here is asking the question, how do we walk in the light of the Lord? Does that mean that I have to be a spiritual uh, junior Jesus 24-7, uh, 365? Is that what you're saying uh, to me, Pastor? What the text is saying to us is, uh, the first thing is we have to prepare for progress. Just name say prepare for progress. This verse number two says, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established. That word established means to determine or make ready or prepare. 
this is very important for us to understand is because none of us are where God wants us to be. But thank God we are not where we used to be. Amen, somebody. I know some of you in here remember when that you used to give people more than a piece of your mind. Some of you remember when you were here on wheels. You, you were a piece of work. You used to get on the devil's last nerve. But now God is preparing you. He is establishing you. He's getting you ready for something you can't handle right now. This is why the word of God is so needed and necessary for the development of our spiritual growth. If we don't take the word of God seriously, we will let it just fly right over our heads. And thinking that the preacher is talking about somebody else and he ain't talking about me. But if you have been praying for a word from God, more than you've been praying for a gift from God. Because if you understand who Jesus really is, Jesus is the word of God. And Jesus is the greatest gift from God. There were a few people, the Bible helps us understand that they were a remnant. There were a few people in the Holy Land that did not give in to the ways of idolatry. They prayed that God would spare them from the judgment that was coming. When the Assyrians were going to come in and take the city captive, God was going to allow a portion of them to be saved. Those who were still praying and believing in the teachings of the Torah, those who were courageous enough not to give in and to accommodate the sins of society. Those who are determined and making ready and understanding that trouble don't last. Always. Somebody out there is struggling with a situation in life that what is going on right now is bigger than what they can see in the future. You have been in a dark place where you couldn't see your way. You didn't see that progress was coming your way. You didn't feel that things were moving in the direction that you believe God had called you. I want to let you know I've been there. Well, I didn't think that God knew what he was doing by the circumstance that he had placed me in. And then when I learned how to get out of self and understand the power of prayer, I could understand what progress was really all about. And I got a word for somebody today. God is right on schedule. Whatever you're going through is preparing you for the next level in which God is establishing you. You got to be determined to get there. But more importantly, you got to be prepared. Many of us want what God has for us, but we don't want to pray. We want somebody else to pray for us, but we don't want to pray here so that we can see the revelation in which God has in store for us. We've got to prepare for progress. The second thing, we've got to prove God's promises. Many people will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob. He will teach us about his way so that we may walk in his paths for instruction will go out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Take your time and pay attention to what Isaiah is really saying to us. That word, word in Hebrew is dabar, which means decree, prove, or report. I'm here to let you know today that in order to convince the unbeliever, I'm not talking about the believer first, the unbeliever that God is real, you got to start doing what his word says. If you are a believer in God's word, you got to act on the word. Many of us are comfortable with hearing the word but doing the word is a different story and many people are in this empirical tangible natural physical world that we live in the only thing people can believe is what they see and so when they see a Christian doing what the word says that's gonna be believing from them enough to come to church and learn more about God when they see a Christian walking in the light of God they don't have to know anything about God, but they can believe in God through seeing what his followers are doing. And then they are prepared to receive Christ in salvation because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
See, what Isaiah was really teaching the children of Israel is, is that God's word was not just for the Jews. It was also for the Gentiles. And if the Gentiles would live by his word, they could reap the benefits of his word. Remember in Genesis 12, what God proclaimed to Abraham, that he would make him a great nation. And he would bless him. And also his descendants would be blessed. And that all of the people of the world would be blessed through his seed. And part of the seed of the Abraham, or the seed of Abraham, is the word of God itself. Because Jesus is a descendant of Abraham. And Jesus is the word made flesh. And so when he came to us, he not only came to us as a fulfillment of scripture, but he also came to us of proof that God keeps his promises. See, some of us got the problem of the right now mentality. Everything that God has for us, we want it right now. But based on our foundation, it's like building a house on sand. And many of us know, who know something about construction, knows what happens when you put a house on sand. It's going to sink. We got to be built on a firm foundation. This is why Zion, which was a particular part of the city of Jerusalem, was a specific strategic place for kingdom building. It was a city that was upon a hill. And any time a hill or a mountain was mentioned in the Bible, it was a sign that a kingdom was about to be established. It was a sign that God was getting ready to build something firm. Because when you build on a firm foundation, touch a neighbor say, that's strong. That's proof that God keeps his promises. Because Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away before one letter of my word thing. I'm so glad that God keeps his promises. And my word to you today is, is that you got to prove to somebody that you really trust God. Not proving it to them in order to please them, but you're proving it to them in order to please him. Somebody didn't get that, so I'm going to say that again. I'm not living right in order to impress anybody. I'm living right as evidence to you that I love the Lord. And he heard my cry. And I'm looking for God to do some things in my life and in order for him to do those things, I gotta put some things aside that are taking my focus away from God. I gotta get off the phone and cut the TV off and stay on my knees. I gotta prove to somebody out there who's struggling with their marriage, whose children are in trouble, who's got a loved one in jail, who's got somebody on their sickbed, that God keeps his promises. Anybody out there need evidence? Anybody out there is looking for something to be proved to show that God is still working in the body of Christ? Everybody did not give in to idolatry. Everybody did not throw in the towel in this text. There were a remnant of people, just a few good faithful folks that still believed in the word of God and the teachings of God. And this is who Isaiah was preaching to. He was not preaching to people who were just coming to church to punch a ticket, who were just coming the church to be seen. He was encouraging those who knew the word of God and understood the power of his word so that they could understand how to walk in the light of the Lord. Not only do we need to prepare for progress. Secondly, not only do we need to prove God's promises, but third and lastly, we got to proceed with passion. Touch your neighbor and say, proceed with passion. Verse number five says, house of Jacob, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. The word walk comes from the Hebrew word yalak, which means to go. It literally means to follow or grow. Anybody out there want to get bigger in God? Anybody out there want to grow spiritually? Anybody want to be taller on the inside than you are on the outside? And that will help you have some passion. Because I've been a few places in my life where I saw nothing but despair. Nothing but discouragement, nothing but disdain, and nothing but despair. And I needed the light of God to be on the inside of me because the light of God could not come from people who did not have any joy. Many of us are looking for joy from people who ain't got the Holy Ghost. Many of us are looking for joy from people who ain't got no prayer life. 
life. Many of us are looking for progress and passion for people who don't even know how to say the Lord's Prayer. Is there anybody out there who really understands it's only going to be a faithful few who's going to pray? And I'm talking about showing up, pray for the church so that the light of God can be evident in our midst. Anybody in here remember that there was an old song that said, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. And let it shine. The reason why. Because God is letting us know that he's purified the church. He's cleansing the church. He's changing us from the inside out instead of the outside in. Anybody out there got the passion to know that God is still, he's still able. He's still turning out the, the things that we think can't be done. He's still performing miracles each and every day. Following the Lord's purifying judgment, Jerusalem will become the center of his universal kingdom of peace. Rather than resorting to warfare, the nations would now allow the Lord to settle their problems. Anybody know that God will fight your battles in anticipation for the coming age of peace? Isaiah exhorted the own generations to seek the Lord's guidance. And instead of being a place of corruption, worship. The temple now would be the center of truth and blessing for both Jews and Gentiles. Can we all see a time when all God's children get together? Whether we got on hoodies or we got on three-piece suits, whether we're black or white, whether we're Asian or Malaysian, when we come together, we're going to be not black people. We're not going to be white people. We're going to be God's people. Anybody want to be known as a child of God? Because when you are a child of God, you're going to get everything that God has for you. Because my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and in glory. Walk in the light, a beautiful light. Come with the dew drops of mercy. Shine bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus is the light of the world. So when he's saying to us to walk in the light of the Lord, what he's really saying to us is that we got to follow Jesus. We got to follow him all the way to Gethsemane. And not only to Gethsemane, we got to follow him to Calvary. Because we follow him to Calvary, that's where we die to the flesh. That's where the dying takes place. And some of us want to go by the grave but we don't want to go by Calvary and Calvary is where we die you got to die touch your neighbor say you gotta die if you die to the flesh then you will be able to go by Calvary and be put in the grave the Bible says we were crucified with Christ they hung him high and they stretched him wide they put him in a grave he stayed there all night Friday he stayed there all day Saturday he stayed there all night Saturday night but early Sunday morning the light of the world got up so that we can see this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine let your neighbor say shine 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 I'm gonna let it shine if you want your light to shine will you say yeah say yeah say yeah oh, oh. Walk in the light of the Lord. Shine on me.
church over, won't you come see it? Shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine. 